So I'd like to ask Bill Orcutt, George Bill Orcutt, to come forward tonight to receive this presentation. Bill, on behalf of the town of Cape Elizabeth, the Ralph T. Gould Award is presented to you for outstanding citizenship. And thank you very much. kept in the town hall with the names of the recipients uh, engraved on it. The first recipient, Ralph Gould himself, and this year's recipient, George, better known as Bill Orca. Bill, we'd love to have you say a few words. And congratulations. Thank you very much. It's a complete shock. I was brought up here in the different editions. I entirely was told on some kind of a committee for the sewers and <laughs> drop in and say hello. But uh, I want to thank everybody very much who was involved. And yes, I've been here a long time, but put a lot of hours in maybe, but I've enjoyed every minute of it. And every kid, whether they had boy or girl in the school, has been super. Never any problems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. I really think that it's people like Bill Orcutt that helped to make Cape Elizabeth such a really great community in which to live. Okay, to get on to the regular part of our agenda. <coughs> uh, are there any councillors who have uh, reports or letters, uh, any kind of correspondence they'd like to report on at this time? Any committees that they've been on? I've received several pieces of correspondence, but each has to do with a particular item on the agenda, so I'll bring them up at that time. I would say the same, Madam Chairman. I've received <coughs> some, and I think we'll be discussing most of them during the course of the evening. So. Okay, thank you. I would like to report on a committee that I've been serving on for six months. It's the Governor's Task Force on the, on the school funding formula. Uh, the committee has completed their work a week ago, uh, and this is the final draft of the committee's findings and recommendations. I'd just like to briefly summarize for you the, the major recommendations that came out of this committee. Uh, the purpose of the committee was to look at the school funding formula to see if it was, if it were equitable, and, and also to see if there were problems with the formula that needed to be corrected. I think the overall uh, uh, findings of the committee uh, were that, yes, the formula is equitable in that it is working the way it was set up to work. It takes money from wealthier communities. By wealthier, I mean communities that are property rich and redistributes that money throughout the state to the communities that do not have very high property valuation. And, and so does, it is working the way it was set up to work. The problem that uh, many of com communities in this area have been facing is that uh, they are no longer receiving much, if any, some communities have are now c receiving no state funds to help support their public education system. So this was one of the major uh, major problems that was addressed by this committee. The committee did recommend that every school system receive at least 5% of their operating uh, funds from the state. So this, if this passes in the legislature, the state would be funding every student uh, per capita uh, student cost at least up to 5%. Uh, that may not sound like much, but it is, a, it is a big improvement for some communities. And Cape Elizabeth is one of those communities who is heading <laughs> slowly toward that 5% rate. So I think it will help us. Also, the committee voted to change the formula and shorten the time lag for, uh, for coming up with what the total funding for the state's uh, share of education should be. And, and that will mean some, up to $12 million more dollars going into uh, to the state funding of education. Uh, the committee also voted to uh, have a hold harmless clause included in the formula. And this would mean that no community would uh, lose more than 25% of their state funds in any one year. Uh, Portland was a community that was drastically affected by uh, losing more than 25% of their funds last year. In fact, they lost over $2 million in one year. So, so this, this kind of... Uh, this would help to uh, stabilize the property tax a little more in, in a community, at least in, in, so that the effect would not be <coughs> 
felt in, in just one year. Uh, we also decide, tried to uh, somehow put an income factor into the state funding formula, which now depends only on property valuation. Wealth is, dependent, is determined only by property values. Uh, we found that working with income, uh, personal income, was a very difficult uh, thing to do. It was, it was impossible to get recent uh, figures from the state. And so what the committee re did recommend was that each school district, which has an inordinate number of students receiving uh, uh, free school lunches, uh, if, if, that, if they had an above average number of students receiving uh, free school lunches, that that community would also get some help. So those were the basic, oh, there's one other, and this one affects Cape was the, uh, that the, that there would be an incentive program built in also to the formula for schools who wanted to try new programs, uh, so-called lighthouse districts, to allow for some funds to be set, of, set aside for new programs. So those were the basic changes recommended. I don't know what, what will happen to it once it reaches the legislature, but we'll see that uh, ne next winter, this coming winter. Okay, uh, if there are no other reports, then we'll move on to uh, the minutes of the uh, September 14th meeting. We have minutes from three different meetings to accept tonight. So I'd like to first, uh, uh, are there any corrections to the minutes of the meeting held on September 14th? Yes, Nancy. On page two, um, the second sentence, in Elsa DeMillo, D-I, okay. capital M-I-L-L-O. Okay, thank you. Any other corrections? Move acceptance. As amended? As amended. Is there a second? Okay, all those in favor? Okay. Motion carries. Uh, six to nine. All right, the minutes of a special meeting that was held on September 21st. Are there any corrections to those minutes? Move acceptance. Is Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay, and then uh, minutes of a meeting held on October 5th, another special meeting. Will they be accepted as a permit? Second. All those in favor? Okay. All right, we now have a public hearing uh, on parking on Ocean House Road near Kettle Cove and on Fessenden Road. And I'm going to ask Frank Latore, who's the chairman of the Ordnance Committee, uh, to uh, familiarize us with those recommendations. Frank? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, as we discussed before, there's been a problem with parking in this area that we're talking about, which is Fessenden Road and Ocean House Road going down to Kettle Cove from the Dairy Joy area, Bowery Beach Road. We have different elements that are at work here. The element of cars that are blocking driveways that are being in front of people's property and which is creating a public safety hazard. The second element is that people do have the right to have their friends and family over. Certainly we all recognize that. But there's two conflicting forces at work here. So what we did on the Ordinance Committee was try to come up with a compromise for this, which basically states that there'll be no parking from 9 o'clock until 6 o'clock, 9 a.m. until 6 p.m. And we felt that this was the heavy, heaviest beach usage. We felt that it, it could be very well a beautiful fall day or a day like today where a lot of people, if this was a Saturday, a lot of people might still want to go to the beach. So we didn't so much see it as a seasonal thing, but as a problem that could crop up year round. So our solution to it was to 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., no parking. That would alleviate the heavy crunch and yet still allow time for family gatherings and all the parking that you could possibly want at night. So after uh, long discussions in the uh, Ordinance Committee, this is the recommendation that we brought forward for public hearing tonight. Okay, are there any members of the public who would like to speak to this issue? Yes, would you come forward, please, and identify yourself? My name is John Maxwell. My wife and I live on Featherton Road, have lived there for, oh, be 32 years this fall. So we have seen a lot of changes in those 32 years. Seems that just a, <laughs> it was just a little while ago that we were up here arguing to put a no parking on these streets. And the reasons for continuing this is the same today, in fact, more so than it was back then. 
As I say, I live on Featherton Road. And is everybody familiar with Featherton Road? I know there's some, I know there's some town roads in the Cape that I haven't even traveled on, and I've lived here all my life. Has everybody traveled on Featherton Road and Ocean House Road to Cattle Cove? Oh, everybody has. So they're probably familiar with it. Those street roads down there are very narrow, especially in front of my house. I'm only speaking for the road in front of my house. I went out and measured it. It's exactly 20 feet from edge of pavement to edge of pavement. A car is approximately six feet wide. So if two cars meet going either direction, that 12, that's 12 feet, leaving, what, what's it left? Eight feet to divide it up into three spaces the edge of the tire on both sides and in the middle. That's not very much. You've got to pay strict attention even in broad daylight meeting another vehicle coming the other way. <coughs> well, as it's been said, uh, brunt of the traffic for the beach is during the daytime, during the summer hours. But anybody who lives on Feathern Road knows that the traffic just begins at 6 o'clock at night, meaning this. Uh, anybody who lives there, and I do, my bedroom's right there. The cars are coming down Ocean House Road, are coming down Pheasant Road, and they're tearing up Pheasant Road all the time, all hours of the night. It's not so much parking for the beach, it's just the traffic on the road. Now, taking that corner into consideration, not so much just the narrowness of the road, the safety because of that corner. My wife coming home from shopping today, came down Ocean House Road, turned the corner to come up Fesleton Road, there was a uh, truck cleaning out the neighbors across the street septic tank, which is a common practice, happens once in a while. There was a lady walking on her left, which would be my right. She had to come to a quick stop because there was no room. Say that was after dark. And she came down, and there were cars parked on just one side of the street, and a car was coming down Fesleton Road, and... She was blinded by the cars coming down Feather the Road. Her lights had not swung around to pick up the back end of the parking cars. What would happen? You, you figure it out. That corner is blind. They use that for a raceway. I'm in the lobster business. I have to get out of my driveway. If you open it up to parking on one side, then there are, are parking during those hours, they will park on both sides. There are ditches on that side of the road. I wish I could draw a diagram. Across from my driveway, all the way up Fisland Road towards Two Lights Road, there's a watershed ditch. There usually is one dug on the lower side of the driveway, all the way down around going towards Kettle Cove. They haven't dug it out this year for some reason or other. I have a culvert, which the town has always had there before I moved there. I put my drainage into that. It was convenient. People come and they park alongside the road. I used to before the no parking signs were there. They would get into that culvert get stuck, they would rant and rave, you know how you have to do to get out, they would call a wrecker, if they couldn't get out, I say I'm completely against parking anytime, day or night, because I couldn't get out of my driveway before, and I can't now if I had to an emergency at night. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Maxwell. Anyone else from the public like to speak on this issue? Hearing that, does anyone have any correspondence on, on this item? I did receive a letter from Mrs. Maxwell also. Thank you very much. And also did receive a letter that was unsigned. And we don't usually uh, recognize letters that, that are unsigned. But in this particular one, the uh, person said that they did not sign a letter because they were frightened. And they were frightened because they felt if they spoke up requesting a ban, uh, a 24-hour ban that they might receive some damage to their home or their property. And uh, they were mostly concerned about the traffic uh, down in the Cattle Cove area in the evenings, uh, the uh, number of young people who congregate down there. And they have felt threatened themselves when they have walked on the beach and uh, trying to get back to their home sometimes have not been, been allowed to pass by people who have been down. The kettle, uh, in the Kettle Cove area. So that uh, this person was requesting that the ban also be extended, uh, as Mr. Maxwell suggested, to 24 hours. Yes. 
Thank you. I, mean, I forgot to uh, also tell you that I received a phone call from Mary Moeller that lives on that road. Couldn't be here tonight, otherwise she would have been here. And she expressed to me that she wished that it could be seasonal. This is, uh, you know, I just thought that I should bring this into the public forum here tonight. She thought that certainly it's a great idea from Labor Day, from Memorial Day to Labor Day, but she questioned other than that whether it needed to be. And she asked if we would consider that as an amendment. So I, that's just, I just wanted to put Mary's input in because she couldn't be here tonight. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone else want to speak now on the, uh, yes? Yeah. My name is Kenwood Garden. I live on Ocean House Road in Kettle Cove. Road. I'm not opposing John, but there are some situations where people only have one driveway. They probably might hold only two cars. My situation on myself, I can pack six and I can pack in the whole field, but not everybody's got that opportunity. So they have to be considered, like Mary Moeller, for instance. She, they have functions there, political functions in the winter time and I think she has uh, uh, church functions from the Quakers I believe. I think that's what she was thinking of as far as the summer months I think she's on the down to Swans Island most of the time but I still oppose packing period but you still have to consider these people that only got like a couple up the road I think there's five five in the family that have vehicles and they only got one driveway that'll hold two cars so if you keep them off the road, that poses quite a problem for them. And they're still citizens of the town. So they, I don't know why they couldn't compromise and say if they had a function, get a packing permit from the police department for that certain function. I know ourselves, we have a musical get-together sometime at different homes through the winter months. And, and anniversaries or anything like that would pose quite a problem on some of the people. Okay, thank you. Anyone else from the public? Okay, then I will close the public hearing and move on to the first regular item on our agenda, which is to consider parking on Ocean House Road near Kettle Cove and on Fessenden Road. Uh, is there anything else, Frank, that you would like to add? No, I think I've tried to give you a flavor of, of the different things and how we came down on it, having considered many different options. We had to make a decision somewhere, and this is what we felt was a fair compromise. Okay, so your compromise is to recommend, uh, no, the Ordinance Committee's recommendation is, is that there be no parking during uh, daytime hours. On either side. On either side of the road. Right. Penny. Um, I guess I just want to throw this out. As you know from our other discussions on different areas of the town, I have some concerns about the restrictiveness that we as a, as a council is now applying to our town. Maybe I just can't adjust to the change in the increase in population or the number of people who now use our community. Uh, since I have also lived here all my life, we certainly didn't have parking problems, that was for sure. Um, but I think I'm sort of interested in Mary Moeller's comment that one of the reasons that we get into this whole parking issue, there's several reasons, I guess two reasons, that we get into this parking issue down in this area. One was during the construction of the Crescent Beach Inn, or the, whatever it is there, the Inn by the Sea. And the other one is during beach season. Uh, it's true, somebody's going to park in front of somebody's house or three or four cars during evening, or, or and in the winter time there's a ban on street parking anyway from whenever it is, December to April, or November to April. So that eliminates that part of the, for overnight parking, at least after midnight. But I think that maybe a reason for addressing this came during the summertime, when people were not paying to park, but wanted to go to that beach and they were parking all over the place. And, I, and I'm not sure if in our effort to, or my effort not to uh, be too restrictive to citizens, that, that maybe Mary Moeller has, a, has something reasonable when she talks about uh, a seasonal item. I don't know how the other council feels. I, I just, I have this thing about being so restrictive. And I don't know if anybody else is interested in Mary's comments or not. Yeah. Well, uh, Bill? Just to, I have a couple of questions for either John and Kenwood, but first I'd like to, to uh, answer one of two of Penny's concerns there is what Mary thought. We discussed that a little bit, I think, in the Ordinance Committee and felt the best way to handle it was so people could have uh, 
family gatherings and what have you, it was come up to a daytime hour deal. One reason why we didn't get too much in the seasonal deal, if I remember right, Frank can correct me, you could take a nice Saturday or a Sunday during the winter, early spring and what have you, and create a parking problem down there. So it's going to be pretty hard to pick out the month that you would want to cut it off. And that is one reason why I think we stayed away from the seasonal deal. So, okay, I'll ask him later. Are you finished, Phil? At that point, yes. Okay. But Penny, you want to respond? Direct, yeah, to his comments. There are going to be times when some families don't want to have a get together. I mean, I can understand your objection. I'm glad it got addressed in the ordinance committee. But on every street in this entire community, somebody's bound to have a birthday or an anniversary or something where there's going to be a traffic problem because and if, he, if somebody had a cocktail party and parked 50 cars out on one of those roads in any neighborhood in that town, any single neighborhood has narrow streets. So it's hard for us to address a problem on, that we don't want to have any traffic jam ever on any night on any time of the year because in every single neighborhood there's bound to be something. I mean, I'm not sure that answers my, my question about the seasonal or occasional family events. Nancy? Um, what the public maybe doesn't realize is, is that when the chairman gets a letter, we all get copies of it. And uh, we try to share our, our comments from uh, townspeople. I do recall that letter from the older couple who feared literally for their lives down there uh, at night from young people. And it, it just seems to me that if our police department uh, knows that uh, inappropriate behavior is going on down in the parking uh, area at Kettle Cove on state property, if beer is being drunk or whatever, that uh, they should be feel responsible for cruising down there and keeping peace and order. Maybe, uh, I see our police chief is here. Maybe he would like to address <coughs> that. It's all right, Madam Chairman. Chair Hoffman, today. Dave, excuse me, Dave, would you mind coming to the microphone? Thank you. Today I went down to the high school, as I do every fall, and spoke to Mr. CEO's class, who has a business law class down there. Uh, one of the comments that was made was why we're always down at Kettle Cove hassling the kids. And I get that every time I go down there. We pay a great deal of attention to Kettle Cove, <coughs> including renting unmarked cars, uh, including stakeouts in the woods, including uh, using police officers from other communities, from using reserve officers down there, and we spend uh, what I would consider to be a good deal of time down there. You're never going to stop all of the problems that you have. You're never going to be able to stop as Penny mentioned, uh, cars from staying off the road all the time. It will not happen. I can't stand here and say that it will. But I feel we're making good effort down there. I feel that the situation has improved a great deal since three or four years ago when we initially put the parking ban uh, into effect. Thank you, Dave. The issue of uh, part-time parking, I guess is what we're going to call this, is because over the last two or three years, we've been trying to resolve the parking problem up away from the beach, from roughly that open field where I think your brother plants just above the maintenance building at the state park. But up through the residential section, up to Route 77, there's been overburdened parking up and through there. We've tried to address that, and I think we've tried to do it in a way in keeping with our policy throughout the town, it's just it's not working. It's hard to foresee when the good day is going to be, especially around here before it's already on, you know, upon us, and it's too late to start uh, putting up the signs after the cars are there. Sometimes it works, but it doesn't always work. And I think this nine to six parking is an attempt to address that whole area in a simple solution. I don't think it will work. I think the area down around Crescent Beach needs to be no parking all the time. Up to Fesenden Road, including Fesenden Road, 
up and through to include that open field on the right as you go down. There's really no houses around there except the one halfway up Dr. Egan. Egan. There should not be any parking there, period, in my opinion. From that point up to Route 77, though, I do think a 9 to 6 parking van could work. There's parking allowed there now. The, the people who live there park on the side of the road occasionally. It works. It's also a narrow road, as Pheasant Road is, but it's not dug out shoulders like Pheasant Road. It's good parking. They can park up on their lawns for the most part, and they don't encumber the road. If it became a real problem down and through there, you can't block access, you can't block your roads, and there's ordinance against that. I think that type of, of no parking restriction could work nine to six. From Asbury's old house down, that open field should be no parking around the clock. And as far as the Kettle Cove issue, I hope that the Harbor Board, when they meet to discuss <coughs> perhaps the future of the beach access and launching boats and moorings and some of the other th topics that they'll be bringing up will address some of the future needs down in there, whether it's going to be town controlled, whether it should remain state controlled, or whether it's a mutual enforcement of, or, or some sort of policy should be drawn up. But I think, uh, you know, as far as trying to attack or address tonight's issue of, of parking on Ocean House Road, if it's ready for a motion, or after some thought, I would like perhaps to, in fact, put on the floor right now a, a, a no parking ban where it exists today, up to and including where Asbury's old house was, or just above that open field. And then a nine to six parking from that point north to Route 77. And if everyone understands, I guess, the areas I'm talking about, and if it dies or, or goes through you. <coughs> Are you making that, that in the form of a motion? That's in the form of a motion, if I was clear. Okay, I, I believe that's quite different from what was uh, put out to public hearing tonight. Well, that's why so. you have a public hearing. No. No, no, no. no. The they public hearing was on the recommendation from the Ordinance Committee. If we, if you wanted to change the recommendation, I think we would have another public hearing and notify the residents of the proposed changes. So maybe what you would want to do would uh, send it back to the ordinance committee with that recommendation. It has to be enough different, and I, and I think what you're saying is enough different. Mm -hmm. than maybe Tom could help. Well, us. well I just I agree with Penny that if the, the new amendments change it to what was sent out. My thought in making this motion was that there currently exists no parking in the area that I would like to continue, no parking. And that the 96 would only affect that area that's been proposed here, except where there's no parking now. But if that's substantial enough, then I would refer it back. Uh, well, so I, I'm not making a motion. Let's okay. just see where this More goes. More discussion? All right, okay. Um, one of the things is that we've talked about, it, which is important, the average citizen need to have some consistency. You have 96 here, but 15 feet up, you can park different hours. Of different, you know, I think that's very difficult. And, and the other thing is, we don't want a whole bunch of different signs lined up along the street, that kind of intensive. But, and, and, if, and if yours was in a motion, I couldn't support that. So I wanted to say that. However, I wanted to make another motion, which we can discuss, which would be enough to change that we'd have to have another public hearing. I can understand the 96 parking vans on these roads. There's no question that there's a problem there. But I would seriously like to consider making that a seasonal 96 parking van since the original purpose for us of even running into a parking problem was only during the beach season. And to have some person who's having a birthday party was never a problem with created for the police department, I don't think, or anybody else. So I would like to consider, in, the, in trying to make it consistent, at least we're going to one change, Exactly as the ordinance reads, 96 parking van from May 1st to October 1st. All right, is there a second to that motion? Second. 
Yes, Frank. I'd like to speak as to having thought about it since Mary Moeller and I talked about it, having heard more discussion tonight. I, Mary's basic point is thank you for trying to protect us for those beautiful days that may pop up in April and, and November, but they're so, so infrequent where the whole beach area is so flooded that parking comes all the way back up like a 90 degree day in July. She, her point was they're just so infrequent in April and, and in March that one or two aren't going to bother the residents as much as the inconvenience of not having the parking will. So uh, I, I like to call this the Mary Moeller Amendment. And I, I will <laughs> certainly favor the passage of it. Could you, could you ask? Yeah, Tom is, would you mind coming to the mic, Tom, for us? The question is whether that sort of amendment would require us another public hearing. Yes. Um, I guess it's a judgment call, but I would say no, because I think it's a, a lesser included change. Uh, I don't think it's that dramatic a change. It's just, you know, maybe I didn't follow all of uh, Mr. Tinsman's, but I think that one at least seems to me that it's a lesser included one that could be passed without a second public hearing. Um, I think. Whenever you have these changes at the night of the public hearing, it's a judgment call, but it seems to me that that's, that's not that different than what was proposed and sent out for public hearing. Okay, thank you. <coughs> yes, Bill? I'm not an attorney, but I don't want to get in an argument with you, but to me that would be quite a change if you're changing it from all year to a seasonal setup. I think that would, in my opinion, be a ch quite a change in how vote against it because I think it should go back to another public hearing. I'm against it, period. I feel that if you're going to have no parking, you should have no parking 365 days a year and forget about this seasonal deal. So this one can have a birthday party in May or June just as well. They can have it in January or February and they might like to park there. And, and there's gatherings during the summer. My main concern, and I agree with uh, Kenwood and John and all those people that live on Ocean House Road or Pheasant Road, there is a good problem down there, in, especially in the summer months and, and good days. And I was very much in favor of feeling that we could solve this problem so someone could have a gathering during the day or in the evening at their house and uh, it wouldn't be flooded up with people parking up and down the street. You could get in and out your driveway, and if you had to squeeze them in on your lawn, you'd have a chance to do it, and somebody wouldn't block it up. I don't quite understand the big problem on Pheasant Road. Uh, there's, I'll admit the, the ditches are there, and I understand the ditches, I know where they are, but there's well, one house on Pheasant Road doesn't have what you call a real long driveway, but I believe he has room enough there if he wanted to have a gathering to get off the street. But uh, I would like to ask him, do they see a problem after six o'clock in the evening that people are packing there? Either Kenwood or John, would you care to answer that? I would go to the chair. Yeah. Why don't we get it again? Do you, see, do you see a real problem if somebody wanted to park along Pheasant Road after 6 o'clock? Well, to tell you the truth, I'm not down on that end of it. I don't want you to. I think so uh, no parking at all. I think it, it's better than what we've got, and I think most of us could live with it. But, but as far as Pheasant Road, I don't know. I know there's a lot of, an awful lot of racing up and down our road at night when they have their beer keg parties, I know it's, you expect to hear something come through the house any day. Well, I think you're going to get that anyway, whether yeah. you're parking or no park. Yeah. But I think anything would be better than what we have. Okay, thank you. John? Yes, I see a definite problem with parking at night on Pheasant Road is because of the blindness of that corner. I mean, I tried. It isn't. It isn't the light that make any difference. The, the two houses oh, okay. are right near the street, and also you've got the spruce trees that mm -hmm. go right out, and and you don't. Sometimes people are not used to that corner; don't even see it until they get there, right. and uh, and they can run cars are parked on the side of the road. Uh, you you come upon them before you know it, and. Uh, 
And as I say, if you open up the parking on one side, or even if you open up the parking period, uh, there will be parking on both sides, and that will close it right off completely. And, uh, and I say that, uh, especially if you're allowing it, allowing it until 9 the next morning, uh, what time, you may not get to work till 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock, but what fishermen get started at 9 o'clock in the morning? And uh, if they're parking overnight, they may not be parked overnight, but sometimes they leave the cars out on the street at night, and we try to go down and meet that corner with people coming the other way. That's a dangerous corner. You come down and try it sometime and just think of the possibilities. The reason why I'm saying this is we haven't had an accident on that corner, but we hear screeching tires, and we hear people coming around the corner, motorcycles and uh, cars, and they just gun it and come right up by our street, our house, and hit that culvert, and we hear them hit that culvert every time. It's, it's just, like a, just like a speed a bump. And, uh, it hasn't happened, but I heard a boy got hit a, on a bicycle up on Two Lights Road, and, uh, and they took down the whole corner of, Calvin, of the elders way back for um, half a mile. If you can't see, of course it creates a problem if you have cars parked overnight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All set, Bill? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Doug? Hey, I just have a question on, on your motion. Uh, you're talking nine to six seasonal from when to when? That certainly is okay. just but you're talking about nine. But you're talking about the nine to six parking ban, and then during the off season, then it'd be just open parking. No. I'm saying that you, wait a minute, what did you ask me? Yeah, May, yeah, May, yeah, May, 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 May to October. May, yes. And from so October to May, there would just be parking allowed any way you felt. It's just whatever. parking the way it has always been. If somebody in their house is having a meeting or a party or whatever it is, people can park in front of their house to go to their meeting. Okay, but consider right now that there is a no parking ban down there. Right now, mm -hmm. on Pheasanton Road, in Kettle Cove, in fact, the Toway Zone is down there, and then up a certain way up Ocean House Road. Is that there at 8 o'clock at night? That's it, 24 hours a day, right now. That's the way it exists. And I'm very much against changing that policy. That's why I would like to leave that alone and to go the 9 to 6 parking from that point towards Route 77. That's where your houses are. That's where they may have their evening get-togethers. That's where only during the daylight hours do you really have a parking problem. The people who will park up there walk down on the beach. They don't do it at night. Any night, any parking along that portion of the road is generally by the people who live there that need the additional parking place because they're having people over to their homes. That's why I thought 96 could work there. Down in Kettle Cove, they've worked hard to get the no parking, and I absolutely would not vote to change that under any condition. It, can, it can't be done and, and, be, and be livable, in my opinion. That corner of Pheasant Road and Ocean House Road, I think has got a real sight distance problem. A few years ago, there was some small shrubs planted there, and those shrubs have grown up. That's causing half the problem. And that's got to be looked at now that those plants have grown up. There are ordinances dealing with certain sight distance at corners, and perhaps you have to look at that. I hate to see trees or tall bushes torn down, but perhaps that back would, would help that corner. Can I answer? Well, it, it just seems to me that we're, we have a lot of ideas bouncing around here, and I know we have a motion before us, right? Mm -hmm. It just seems to me, although I hate to do it, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> that it really should go back to the Revenue Committee because um, we, we do have two separate ideas. Mm -hmm. But we're going to eliminate that in a minute. You are? Yes. You really think so? All right. But we really are changing the proposal that, well, that, that the Revenue Committee came before you with. And that may be an issue that right, Penny? Right. Yeah. Penny, go ahead. No, I, I think Nancy's right. If, if we all went with what Doug is saying, maybe that's kind of a change that we'd have to have another public hearing. But I'm willing to withdraw, if the secondary is willing to withdraw, I'm willing to withdraw my seasonal uh, amendment because I think Doug is right that it's already seasonal from where the residences are. Right? No, Wait no, no, no. All right, no. Let, me, let me get this straight then. From Bethany Road up to Barbara Beach Road, where the, most houses are, 
That is not where the 24 hour parking van is, is that right? That's correct. That is. There's, there's no parking on either side of Ocean House Road northerly from Kettle Cove parking area to a point 150 feet northerly of the Ocean House Road, Fesman Road intersection. That's as far north as the no parking goes. Right now, forever 24 hours, ever. Okay. 24 hours no parking. What happens from, from that intersection of Pheasant Road up to Firewood Beach Road? In the summer and during okay. busy days, there's a parking problem. All right. So 9 to 6, we want to say there'll be no parking from that point up to Firewood Beach, but in the evening then after 6 o'clock, people who can come to people's houses can park. That would, that, was, yeah. I agree. that was my motion. I agree with you. Uh, Frank? I would like to say I agree with that, with his interpretation. And, and uh, that's what, I mean, at the Ordinance Committee, we said this is what we're going to propose to try to stimulate discussion with the public. I think we've stimulated, and I think we can come to a consensus tonight to set something else for public hearing, which is right. basically keeping no parking on beds and no parking the, the present part of uh, Ocean House that it is. And then 24 from a, hours. 24 hours. And then from a certain point up, from May 1st till October 1st, there's no parking from 9 to 6. I think that consensus is warming enough to be able to set it to a public hearing because it's altering it too much. But I don't think it has to go back to the ordinance committee. That's my opinion. All right, Penny, are you willing to withdraw your motion? Yes. Oh, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Withdraw. I withdraw my second. All right. Uh, would someone like to make a new motion? <laughs> well, I'd like to make a motion after I direct a question through the chair to the residents that live there. Okay. With a, with a, if I, Go ahead. With a seasonal no parking, 9 to 6, from roughly that field towards the takeout work. I mean, we're going, we're proposing no parking on front of your house, 9 to 6, from, our, from May to October. Is there going to be a problem from October to May? Not with May. I don't know. You know, I'm just speaking for myself. If I, I've got a field, I've got a driveway, it'll take six cars, that, that just solved my problem, there's no packing, but it might be a, a problem for my neighbor. He's got five cars and only one driveway for two. I know it's difficult to please everybody. I think right straight <laughs> across the line. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, my concern is... It's pretty is, hard to divide it up. It's going to make it confusing. My concern is if the seasonal aspect will address their parking problems, I would go with the seasonal park. You know, initially I didn't propose it to be seasonal. In the spirit, well, you said to, get, the spirit of compromise. to get the votes, I think I'll need to get <laughs> the motion we passed, I would, I, would, I would go for the seasonal park. So I'd make that a motion. All right. Uh, just a sec. Could you, would you make your motion so that the uh, our secretary can take it down, please? I would move that this be referred back to the Ordinance Committee to restudy right. with the current no parking status down in that area to remain as it is with the addition of a seasonal October, I mean a May to October seasonal 9 to 6 parking from that point of no parking north through 77. Is there a second? Second. All right, and now discussion. Yes. I don't think that we should be making an ordinance here at a council meeting. I agree with that. Out of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. any, any other comments? Yes, Frank? What procedurally, having our town attorney here, or maybe you could tell me, whoever could inform me procedurally, do we have the right tonight to set to another public hearing this motion? In other words, without it having to go, legally, it doesn't have to go to the ordinance committee, correct? <coughs> So in my, in my experience with the Ordinance Committee, which is two and a half years on and one and a half years as the chairman, if there is a consensus on an issue like this, it's an important issue to the residents, but it isn't an issue of the sewer magnitude or of some of the other magnitudes. If we form the consensus, I don't see why, which seems to have emerged after an hour and of discussion, why we can't set that to a public hearing. If more input, if different things happen, and it really bogs down again, then I'm more than willing to send it to the Ordinance Committee. But I think we're just... We don't always have to, as a knee-jerk reaction, send it. I really wish people would, would think that through. We've discussed it at the Ordinance Committee. We've had a nice public hearing. We've done what the process wanted it to do. And I think it's, a, it's really a mistake to send it back. I think it's a type of unnecessary type of time. That's, uh, I think there can be exceptions, and this is a classic case of one of them. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Frank. Uh, 
It doesn't seem that there's any great urgency at this point to, to rush to another public hearing next month if we don't have to because we're talking about a seasonal change anyway and we're getting into the winter months so uh, I personally would rather you we use the process because there may be something that we didn't think about tonight that the audience committee might, given more time, uh, have a chance to think about and, and get some wording that that we'll need before we send it to public hearing. Nancy? And in addition, I don't consider this an unimportant issue. No, oh, I don't. Know. Uh, it seems to me that uh, we've spent an awful lot of time recently on parking issues and trying to be fair to everyone involved. And it's Tricky. It's really tricky. This whole well, night is. More time. <laughs> this whole night uh, is. We are going to be talking about parking on several different issues. So. Yes, Bill. I just want to say that I will vote to send it back to the audience committee, and I think the other member of the audience committee is going to convince me that we should have a seasonal deal. I feel it should be nine to six around, 365 days a year. It gets confusing to the people whether I can pack this month or maybe no, I gotta wait and so on and so forth. And I okay. can't see why I couldn't be around so hard. Uh, I think that I think we're ready to uh, vote on this. We've had plenty of discussion. All those in favor of sending this back to the audience committee. Okay, all those opposed. Okay, the motion carries four to two. which means that the audience committee will probably report back to us at the, at the November uh, regular meeting of the town council and probably there will be another public hearing on, on that recommendation in December. So the, the residents will be notified uh, of what the next recommendation will be. Yes. I'd like to mention the fact that if they, if they went along with a no packing, whether there would be a chance to have a sign at the head of the street from each end that would say no parking at any time during those hours and state so as a tollway. No parking signs don't seem to have much clout to them. They park there for, you know, if they get a $5 fine, park there all day and go to the beach, it's worth it to them compared to over the state park or anything else. So I think I'd rather see a sign at each end of the street than having many number of signs every 50 feet, which will cost the town quite a bit to put up. Scarborough does it and it worked quite well over there, but they have to stay on top of it. That's something we've discussed before and uh, I think we can discuss that again okay, before, when, when the changes are made. Thank you very much. I Dan? think some of the discussions that we've had to answer your question because I know it's about, I think by law, the statute you have to have signs so many feet in order to be enforceable and I'd like We'll move on now to item number 185, which is to consider parking on bike paths within the town of Cape Elizabeth. We don't always spend a whole night talking about parking, but tonight we're going to spend lots of hours, I think, on parking. Uh, this year, the Ordinance Committee uh, looked at the total of our traffic ordinances and made many recommendations for revisions. And back several months ago, the town council did vote to pass those revisions as suggested by the ordinance committee. Included in those revisions was a ban on parking on Route 77 in the bike lane. Uh, we had a, we went through the whole process that we are going through to, tonight. The recommendations were brought to the council. The council set a public hearing on the revisions. Uh, and then after the public hear hearing, did pass the revisions. Once uh, the people living on Route 77 were notified that they would, parking would no longer uh, be allowed on Route 77, uh, many residents uh, came forward and asked if we would reconsider uh, the parking ban. Uh, we did, the council agreed to reconsider that one aspect of uh, the traffic revisions and we held another public hearing 
uh, last month. Uh, we had a workshop uh, two weeks ago on the issue. Uh, and I think we had an emerging consensus at that workshop. Uh, after hearing from members of the public, uh, I would say maybe, uh, and anyone can correct me if, if they want to, but I would say the comments that we received were about two to one in favor of removing the parking ban. Uh, there were, uh, and mainly the people who wanted the ban removed uh, were people who's, who had very short driveways, something we've already talked about tonight, whose uh, land, uh, a large part of their land was taken and their driveway when Route 77 was uh, widened. So that uh, many of them, if more than two, pe two cars are parked in their driveway, if they have guests or if they have service people come, have no room to park their cars. We did hear from uh, people who used the uh, bikeways regularly, uh, uh, both for jogging, for riding their bikes and whatever, who urged us to uh, continue with the parking ban. So uh, we have been listening to all testimony and, as usual, trying to come up with some sort of a compromise uh, that would be uh, address the public safety problems, yet not be so restrictive uh, that we create more problems than we're solving. <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> the council at their workshop <coughs> seemed to be leading toward allowing parking in the bikeways except within business zones. And our reasoning for that was that the business zones, which would be in front of the Crescent Beach Inn, in front of the IGA area, in front of uh, the town hall here, uh, that these areas are, are highly congested, that there are uh, more driveways with cars coming in and out, and so for public safety reasons, we really felt that those areas uh, probably should have a parking ban. But in the residential areas, uh, in order to uh, try to solve some of the problems of the residents in those, res in those areas, that we would uh, discourage parking but not, uh, not prohibit it. So uh, we are here tonight to, uh, to talk about, to talk more about parking uh, in the bikeways and to hear anybody from the public who, we have had a public hearing, but if there's anybody here tonight who, who would like to speak on this issue, we'd be happy to hear them before the council begins their deliberation. Yeah. Would you come forward, please, and introduce yourself? Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Millie D. I live on Ocean House Road across from the 14th T and 15th, you know, 14th hole and 15th T across from the Paputic. For myself, I have parking. But I'm thinking, you know, year after year, a lot of people have come and parked and gone cross-country skiing. Year after year, the kids have gone skating. The kids have, many, probably many of you, sliding. And you say discourage parking. Are you going to take the no parking ban? I walk along that stretch of road, and there's one, I believe, near Bothell's garage. And then there's not another one for quite a stretch, it's not as, you know. In other words, someone might mi miss that sign and park and be told or get a fine. It's not that public. I mean, I only noticed that there's it, you've got it on both sides of the street today because I'm looking for it now. But it's a four lane, I, it's not like Kettle Cove it's not a narrow road, it's very wide, it's like a four lane, and I don't understand why one side of it cannot be left open for parking. Okay, so you would recommend that only one side? I would recommend that, uh, like you say, discourage it, but if you're just going to discourage it, that doesn't mean people will know about it, will it? Uh, that they well can the park there. We could alert the people who uh, live on 77. But we, 
Why? That, that area near Perpudic is one area that we, there was a lot of concern about. Uh, and I think it was one of the reasons why we did reopen this whole discussion is because we felt that we did not want to restrict people from being able to go cross-country skiing in that area. So that, we, we, we are talking tonight about lifting that ban. But you also used the word discourage people. Yes. So that doesn't mean lifting the ban, does it? Well, yes it does. Sure, it does? Yeah. yeah. Then thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your comment. Yes, Peter. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My name is Peter Rich. Some of you may know me. I. Uh, I thought I was attending an old meeting uh, here. We started by talking about school funding, and I saw some of my old friends here, and I saw the young people here. I thought it was the wrong meeting for time. Uh, I think the town council, if it is headed toward lifting the ban, is headed in a very bad direction. I tell you, I came back last Saturday night, and I and I looked at the mail that had gotten home and there was something from my class at college and one of my classmates there was a notice that he had died he had died on September 20th he had died of head injuries sustained in a bike accident he left a wife, Constance, a son, and two daughters. I have a wife, Linda, a son, Thomas, and two daughters. That struck home, and I asked myself what I was doing biking. Is it a death wish that I have? No, I enjoy life to the full. I am excited about life. I am concerned about the area that we live and. For that reason, and it's partly that reason, I bike. I believe that we should decrease the number of cars if possible. I believe that by biking to work in the morning, I am somehow doing a small part toward relieving a congestion in Portland and making life just a little bit better. I honestly believe that. And I began to think about this meeting and I thought about the fact that I came back from church on Sunday in the rain. There's a stretch on Route 77 that it dips down after Spurwink and then climbs back up again. It was pouring rain. There were two cars parked in the, in the bike lane. I noticed there was ample room in the driveways for them to park. They were parked in the bike lane. What happens when a car parks in the bike lane? The bicyclist has to pull out and go around and come back again into the path of the cars that are coming from the rear. Now, that creates the, the turning out and coming back in. All I can say as I think about that from an automobile standpoint is if you're, part, if you're driving on the bridge and the police officers have stopped a car on the bridge you have to pull out around and go back again. That presents a hazard. And it's that same kind of hazard that the bicyclist faces. And the car too, when, I, when I'm in a car and I know that a bike has to turn out around an object, I don't know how far he's going to turn, she's going to turn. And that's a problem. And it seems to me that you're weighing the safety of the bicyclist against perhaps the incidental convenience of some of the townsfolks. And I think that's a weighing job, and I think the scales go on the side of safety. And I hear what you said about people losing their land on the taking of 77. I was here for the discussion of the widening of 77. By and large, there were not more than two feet taken. That's my recollection. I may be off, but mainly that 
the, when 77 was built up, it was built up with the already existing right of way. It was, the existing right of way was maximized to its fullest. The state and the town already had that right of way. In certain areas, yes, there was land taken. There were trees taken for site clearance. But basically, that strip was designed for folks to use for more than automobiles. And I think we're going back, and I think we're doing a disservice to the townspeople by providing an alternate form of transportation and a safe alternate form of transportation. And that's what I have to say. And I really wish you would think again your thought about easing the ban, that's all wrong in my view. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Uh, just to, to clarify one thing, uh, the ban only went into effect about, I think it was three months ago. Prior to that time, it was unclear where the parking was allowed or not allowed in the bikeway. In any event, it was uh, no parking was never enforced. So the uh, the ordinance was an attempt to clarify uh, the parking situation in the bikeway. Uh, Frank. May I comment on what you just said? Sure. I'm not, I'm not 100 percent convinced myself that it was unclear in that it said there's no, there would be no parking from the white line, from the safety zone to shoulders or curbing. That to me is not unclear in terms of what, just, just to continue to frame this discussion, it's not unclear to me as to what the present law for years and years and years was, which is that it was illegal, as it would be in any emergency breakdown or whatever. So according to the, the old ordinance, which, which I have here in front of me, it simply states no parking from the safety zone to the curb. So I just wanted to put in my opinion on that. Thank you. Does anybody else from the public want to speak on, on this item? OK, if not. Uh, the council ready uh, for any kind of action? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Hi, uh, my name's Russ Lamer, and I would just like to point out something about uh, uh, bicycle lanes. Uh, I, too, am a bikist, and I started that uh, this year uh, for exercise purposes. And uh, I travel Shore Road, I have to, to get where I'm going, and uh, that's a very dangerous road. In fact, I'd like to see more bike paths put into Cape Elizabeth, especially on that road. Uh, this year, I almost had a, a near-fatal accident uh, because of a parked car. Uh, it was not in Cape Elizabeth. It was in South Portland, but I was coming from Cape. And I just want to stress this because it is dangerous, uh, just as uh, Peter said. Uh, I was coming up on a, on a parked car. At first, I wasn't sure whether or not it was parked uh, because it wasn't supposed to be there. Uh, and uh, I had to go pull out, <coughs> just as Peter was talking about. Two other cars were coming very fast uh, from the uh, back of me, and I had no choice. And I had to slam on my brakes, and I almost went into the uh, parked car. Uh, so there is a great danger, uh, I believe, uh, by uh, allow allowing parking in the bike pass. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Any counselors have any comments? Yes, Frank? I'd like to uh, this evening make, I've, I've kind of voiced my opinion, but I'd like to again make a number of points that I feel very deeply about on this issue, as I'm sure other counselors feel just as sincerely. To give us a little review, this started when we were looking at the traffic ordinances and trying to update some of the traffic ordinances. What we presently have and for years had was a parking ban in terms of from the safety zone over to the curbing, over to the shoulder, meaning that we had had one in effect, in effect creating an emergency breakdown lane on these roads. So parking has been banned for years legally. Whether it was enforced or not, that's another issue. But legally, it stands there that it has been banned. But when you go back to the creation of the bike route, and I spent a good part of the day up at the Press Herald Library looking up all the old articles and catching some of the enthusiasm from 1979 and 1980. Uh, Peter Rich was on the committee, other committees were formed to create this bike way. It's important to go back to that one. And look, why were lands taken? Why was a great amount of federal and state money and some local money spent? It was to create a bike route, and a very unique bike route, because we had a bike route that had no parking that was coupled with a no parking area. So we had a very unique commodity in this town, which was a bike route where there was no parking.
And I know that the town officials, and rightfully so, touted this as one of the great amenities of capitalism. You can bike, you can bike from the South Florida line to Crescent Beach State Park uninterrupted. It's, it's an excellent, it's an incredibly unique thing. It had also to do with the fact that there was an energy crisis, there was an exercising craze was starting, and we needed to develop alternative modes of transportation. I thought it was very, it was very important and rightfully touted. But it was touted as being a safe way for bikers to go. That when you see the articles, you see the word safe used over and over again. And this is by far my biggest concern. It's public safety. Is it right to ask, to continue to call this a bike route, that we're promoting as a bike route as one of our amenities, and to ask bikers to veer off into Route 77 and come back? We know that's going to happen. As the word gets out more and more that parking is allowed, more and more parties develop, Bikers may have to go around two, three, four, ten cars and then come back, being that long on Route 77. I simply say that that's inviting danger and that that's very poor public policy. To have taken this kind of land, to have spent this kind of money, to encourage the creation of this very unique recreational resource, and then to change the rules five or six years down the road, to me, is just wrong. Now, I sympathize with some of the problems that people have in terms of parking. But the fact of the matter remains is we've created this recreational resource. It's there. We should do all that we can as counselors to make it safer, not make it more dangerous. And I was thinking all afternoon about what if we had citizen support right now? What if we mobilize the citizens, get the funding, and get the council votes, and create a bike jogging route along Shore Road? Let's think about that. That could happen within the next year or so. That can happen because everyone would love to have a biking route. But imagine going through all that energy and all that excitement and the opening of the bike route, and then a counselor comes along in six years and decides to allow parking in that bike route. I just think that those kinds of things, coupled with the public safety issue that we just can't get around, will be asking bikers at one time or another, especially up towards the South Portland line, that it's our policy to have them veer into the highway. I can't be part of that, and I couldn't vote for, for eliminating it. So I know, I know there's other problems that have to be created, but up here it's a tough position for me to be in, but it's a balancing act, and I do have to come down on the side of public safety. So I thank my fellow counselors for indulging me and <laughs> allowing me to give those heartfelt words. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Well said. Uh, Doug. Well, I, going back to some of the discussions that we had in our last council meeting, we really discussed this, and I know a lot of people weren't here, and it wasn't televised. That was great. However, some of the discussion purposes, for, for the sake of this discussion, just to answer some of Frank's questions and concerns that he felt he should raise, the bike route, as opposed to bicycle lane, as opposed to exclusive use, was brought up. And, and I have absolutely no problem with designating that portion of Route 77 as a bicycle route and I think we've talked about putting up advisory signs should this ordinance be clarified that there should be parking allowed in certain areas of it. To advise motorists that there may be more bicycles in this particular area of Route 77 than in other side roads and whatever, to at least advise them that uh, bicycle usage may be heavier. But another side of that discussion was the fact that Route 77 is such a wide road and it is, for all practical matters, a four-lane highway. And the fact that the travel lane is wider than the normal travel lane, the bicycle lane in many portions is much wider than a car. If you properly park against the curb in a vehicle, you still have room for two or three bikes, or at least one bike, to travel within that bicycle lane to go past that parked car. Plus, you have a travel lane probably 14 feet or wider, which is almost as wide as the whole of Fesedon Road, for one vehicle to pass. Now, I'm very concerned about the safety, as everyone else is, for bicycles. What happens when they get to South Portland? You know, we talked about a, an accident that happened in South Portland for this very purpose. The roads narrow up. There's a little tiny line, and everybody thinks it's an extension of Cape's bicycle lane, and it is not. They all travel it, the cars hug it. You know, it, we're causing an unsafe condition in South Portland, in my opinion. Fast bikes today, or bicycles today, can go 30, 40, 45 miles an hour, because they go that fast. I see them, they pass me. <laughs> 
they also go zipping by me when I'm at a stoplight. Now I'm sure not all bicyclists do this, but I would, and I, I, I don't know what percentage, but I would dare say a good portion of those bicyclists get hurt. And there, there are statistics, and we can talk statistics, we can talk accidents, we can talk anything. But I do know that a bicycle that travels 30 or 40 miles an hour is probably not a, the intended use for bicycle lane. In a bicycle lane, I would think, for exclusive bicycle traffic would be the slow bicycle meandering back and forth and not being very safe. But the business zone, you know, I, I totally agree. There should not be any parking. You need your sight distance. All businesses within the town of Cape Elizabeth should be regulated that the park can be able to take care of their business and it should not overflow into the street. And so therefore, I would support the lifting of the ban with the restriction that in no business zone should there be any parking in the bicycle route. And that bicycle route advisory signs replace the bicycle lane signs that currently exist and that no reference be to no parking in that, uh, in that lane. Is that in the form of a motion? Yes. All second. Did, did you get that? No, please. Okay. The motion, the, the motion is, is written. All right, you want it as written. I would prefer the motion as written. <clears throat> the motion uh, that we have before us is uh, to allow parking along or within a bikeway within a business zone. No, to ban parking along or within a bikeway within a business zone or in any specially designated safety zones reserved by order of the town council for a specific purpose, including but not limited to footpaths, jogging trails, and ways created for recreational use. Is there a second to that? I already seconded it. You seconded it, Nancy? Okay, further discussion. Penny. Well, I, I think maybe I'm going to revert back to my old phrase. I wish there was some way of getting into the record, and that is we begin to suffer from paralysis from over-analysis. And it always seems to fall into when we talk about ordinances. I, from the beginning, when we reconsidered this, uh, have felt very strongly that in, in response to Frank's comments about the fact that bicyclists were used to having this to their own space and that we shouldn't change the rules midway, to ban parking 100% and to enforce that and make that a tow-away zone is changing the rules for the taxpaying citizens who live on Route 77 between here and the South Portland line. Certainly you guys can agree with Doug that to travel on a five or six foot or four to six foot wide bike path that narrows down to two feet when you hit South Portland and has no bands at all on whether you can or cannot park is not considered to be a safe route. I also think that we at the town council should refer to that since it was designated by the Department of Transportation as a bike route and not a bike path that I take offense that we continue in our written work to discuss it as a bike path. Because a bike path has state rules that come on it that, that have a lot of bans and regulations, and a bike route, which is what this is, in my understanding, does not have those same things. So I would like to see that as a bike route. I personally do not know where the majority of, bike, bike, of cyclists or joggers live that use that strip, uh, and, I, and may, it may certainly be an unimportant point. But I find that I, I need to respond to the citizens who've lived on Route 77 for a long time and paid taxes to this community for the preservation of their enjoyment of their property. It's my feeling that why can't we just leave it the way it is? Parking from, even the cyclists that here at the public meeting said that parking was not a common, there was not 15 cars parked in the bike path every single day, all day long that it was an irregular thing that cars might be parked on that bike route. Why can't we leave it just the way it is that allows the citizens of this community to take their children and go to the quasi-municipal Pecoria Club to use the facilities for sliding and skating and using it as a family use? I dare say that if we ban 100% and have the police department, the public works department, whoever it is out there towing vehicles and ticketing vehicles when some poor young mother's out there with the two young children and all they want to do is slide, then we're going to have a real problem, and I don't want to be part of that. I don't understand why we can't just leave it the way we've been doing it since the day that fight rule was initiated in this community. 
The day it was initiated in this community, we designated it as a place for bicyclists and joggers or walkers, whatever they are. But never once did we enforce a no parking van where you're towing off some poor citizen's car or some poor young person's car that's out there cross-country skiing. Now, I just think it's very difficult to say, OK, everybody, we changed our mind. We're going to start enforcing that now, and everything's going to be a tollway zone. I find that very difficult. I, for one, am in favor of leaving that section of Route 77 exactly as we have done it before. Maybe we could put a sign up uh, as you enter that right route, or that route, whatever it's called, by saying, caution pedestrians and cyclists, uh, which is not an unusual sign. Uh, put something like that up. But I would like to, for the citizens who came forward here, just leave it the way it was, without putting more restrictions than this strong community. I just uh, don't want to do it. So I would support the motion as written, which was the consensus that we had arrived at, not necessarily the vote tonight, but the consensus at the time, that I would support making a parking ban in the business zones of the town of Cape Other councilors would like to comment? Bill? Yes, uh, I'm in support of what we have in front of us here this evening. And uh, I have heard from quite a few people along Ocean House Road there that did lose land. And I think I know one or two last more than two feet. And uh, they do have a problem as far as the driveway. And I don't think they abuse the parking part on the bike lane. And uh, so I feel, uh, as Penny just said, put it back the way it was. And uh, if they have pulled over, I believe there's, there's type there's room really enough for bicyclists to get by. It's much better highway to bike on than anywhere they can go once they leave Cape Elizabeth. South Bowling, Scarborough, anyone. I think Route 77 in Cape Elizabeth has the best area and most room as far as biking goes that has its come once they leave Cape Elizabeth. And uh, so I will support the motion. Any other counselors? Uh, Frank? I just wanted to uh, address two things that Doug asked as a question, I guess. And I also wanted to, to, to clarify that when they say that it was a consensus that was reached at the workshop, that means kind of generally an agreement. I, I certainly didn't agree with it then. I don't agree with it now. And I just want to go on record. But so everyone understands what we mean when we say consensus here. Um, what happens when you get to South Portland? That was the question that was raised. I'm not a counselor in South Portland. I live in Cape Elizabeth. I ran for the council. I'm here. I'm proud of the bike group. Having read the history today, I'm proud of all these people dozens and dozens of people that organize and work hard to create it. And I would urge my fellow counselors in South Portland to extend the bike route, to keep going with this spirit, and perhaps have a no parking van along their route. As a matter of fact, when you read these articles, it's talked about this is the beginning of a regional bikeway that was dreamt up, believe it or not, to go from Bar Harbor to Kittery, where you could go on a bike. This was a part of that, and both John Henchy and, and Mike McGovern talk about it over and over in terms of this is just part of the region. So in terms of South Portland, I, I invite them to join along with us and, and extend their rights in terms of this, this goes. Secondly, I guess the only thing is the judgment call. Is it dangerous for, car, for bikes to go around the cars that are parked from the South Portland line to Bothell's garage? I don't know if you've ever gone on a bicycle from South Portland line to Bothell's garage on either side of the road when there's a party and there's many cars parked. I contend, quite simply, it is very dangerous. There may be parts of the bikeway where you can get one bike through with a car parked, but that doesn't mean that when you're opening the door and the driver's getting out, as we see all the time, there's a problem. We don't know when, this, when the driver's going to get out of the car and whack that, that biker with the door. This, these things happen all the time. It's not just some reality. So for me, to us to be sitting here making judgment calls of that magnitude, especially from Bottles to the South Portland line, I think is, again, bad, bad public policy. And I really wish that, that my fellow counselors would go look at that or take a bike out and ride it. I invite you to ride with me and check it out for yourself with your own eyes. I think, I think we're asking citizens to do inherently dangerous things, and I think it's wrong. Thank you once again. Okay, thank you, Frank. I'd just like to say before we take the vote that I'm really pleased at how many citizens came to so many different workshops and did speak up on this issue. 
And I think we all like to hear from citizens and like to respond to citizens. And for that reason, uh, I was particularly moved by Peter Rich's comments tonight and always listen extra hard when Peter speaks. Uh, but this, on this issue, there were, we as a council had not received complaints before we changed the ordinance from the public uh, or from bikers or from anybody saying that we've got to do something about the cars that are parked in, in the bikeways. The only area that was brought to our attention was up by the Crescent Beach Inn when the construction was going on up there and all of the workers who had been brought in from all over southern Maine were parking in the bikeways and in people's yards and, and did create a real problem in that business zone. So uh, I, I do feel that what we're doing tonight is addressing the major complaints that were brought to us and keeping things the way they were prior to that. However, I would be the first one, if by the action we take tonight, if by uh, only banning parking in um, the business zones, if people living on Shore Road, I mean on Route 77, now feel that they can park in the bike lane at, at any time uh, and do do that, then I would be the first one to come back and, and propose that we reconsider this uh, this item if that does become a real problem. Right now, I don't see that it's a real problem. So I, I, I don't I don't think that we should overreact and be too restrictive when when we haven't we're not facing the problem. Uh, so with that, if there aren't further comments at this time, Frank. I do have. I just do have one more comment. I don't, I don't understand what you mean in terms of if citizens feel that they can use and park there any time. Certainly, if tonight we legalize parking in the bikeway, they have every right to park there all they want and have as many parties and do all. I mean, what, what do you mean by if they? If well, I think like if they abuse the right, they certainly have every legal right to park as many times as they want, whenever they want. To the park. people that did spoke that came and spoke at the meetings and the people I talked to on the phone all said that they certainly prefer to park off the road. It's for their benefit as well as the bikers. And that it's only in on occasional, uh, on occasion that they need uh, to use the bike path for all the reasons that we've given tonight, parties, uh, whatever, or if you're having your driveway tied and you have, to. there are certain times uh, when that happens. But on a regular basis, I don't think the people living on 77 want to park in the bike. And, and so I don't think it's going to be a problem. If it is, we'll come back and we'll address it again. Because then it will become a public, a real public safety issue that uh, we, we have to speak to. Yes? I won't take up time. I know you've got okay. a lot of chores ahead of you. But I thought the government paid for about 90% of a pack of bike for the sake of safety. And it sounds to me like they're taking, substituting safety and adding it on convenience. And I know they use a lot of that. I've seen a number of times every day. They will take that bicycle lane for a passing lane because they don't want to slow down for the car that's going to make a, make a left or right-hand turn. Well, that, those kinds of things you're never going to be able to legislate against. People are going to, to do things yeah. that they shouldn't do. And I, I don't think that, unless there happens to be a police uh, right there at the time. I know down at the Bowery Beach happened. Road for the State Park entrance, especially before Memorial Day, you get a nice spring day, both sides of the bicycle lane, both sides of the road lined up, and especially after Labor Day when they closed up the park. You get a day Saturday or Sunday like we had today, there'll be a lot of traffic there on both sides, but really it's all... We are working with the, the uh, State Department of Parks and Recreation to try to get them to keep that gate open longer. I know they've closed already this year and to make more parking available within the park mm -hmm. in the off season. So we're working on that issue too. But thank you for your comment. Okay, are we ready for the vote now? Does everybody remember the motion? Yes. Okay. We have it before us. All right, all those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? Okay, the motion carries five to one. <laughs> 